Just a couple of things before we begin. First, uh, if you happen to miss the ushers and you have those cards, don't worry. We'll get you on the way out. Uh, you can drop that as you leave. Um, thank you for those of you that filled those out. And second, uh, Emma Pavey. You're right. Your mom is the coolest organist I know. Uh, you, can, you can ask Sarah about that story at a later date. So, uh, If you're wondering who I am, my name is Jeff Frazier. I'm the lead pastor here. Maybe you were expecting Joe Scavato. He was on the schedule, our pastoral resident, to preach. Uh, Joe is unable to be with us. I'm filling in for him. You can pray for Joe. Uh, we love Joe. He's doing a great job here. Joe's father is in the last stages of ALS and uh, may pass any day. And so we've given Joe the weekend off uh, to be with his family, which is appropriate. So pray for him. And speaking of prayer, let's bow and ask God to speak to us through his word. Father, your word is living and active. You've told us that in it. It's able to pierce our minds, our thoughts, our intentions, and right down to the soul. And we need that even though we don't always like it. So speak to us, Lord Jesus, you who are the living word made flesh. We pray this in your name. Amen. Some of you might have received, if you're on the email list, probably all of you, if you're a part of our church family, received an email from me and from our church family uh, signed by me about uh, the coronavirus and the steps we're taking you know, to, to put people at ease. Some of people are nervous about this, others are not. I don't really worry about germs too much. Uh, one time, I'll tell you this funny story, when, I was, when Noah, uh, who's here this morning, when he was a baby, he was born early, um, very early actually, we brought him home and he was, my wife was worried about germs. When your firstborn is worried, you wipe down everything. By the third or fourth child, you're like, ah, they'll make it. You know, anyway, I, I woke up in the middle of the night, I thought it was raining. There was like a mist falling on my face. And I, my wife was, stand, Noah slept in our room in a bassinet, and he, he had uh, respiratory issues at the time. And my wife was spraying Lysol over my head. It was drifting down on me because I was coughing in my sleep. She was disinfecting me <laughs> while I slept. So some people are nervous about germs. Others are not so much. And, I'm, and there are reasons uh, to be nervous. There are reasons to take precautions. Although I will say, like all this, uh, all the craziness about washing our hands, has nobody been washing their hands prior till now? Have we all just been like, ah, you know, so. Anyway, for all of our technological advances in the world, there's, there are reasons to be, we, the world is still a, an insecure place. Some of those uh, are, I think, maybe exacerbated by panic and social media and so on. But there are legitimate reasons to be worried Cautious? The world is not a safe place. Where do we turn for security? Where do we turn for protection in an insecure and fearful world? Historically, Christians have turned to the promises of God in Scripture, particularly the promises of God in the Psalms, for their strength, for their protection, for refuge. The psalm we're going to examine today is one of the great psalms of confidence. It's been a source of comfort and confidence to God's people through the centuries. Countless Christians in times of trouble have turned to this psalm. And it's specifically directed toward and written for those people who, are, who need God to be their refuge and their protector. So if you're here this morning and, and you don't need that, those of you who have no troubles, no concerns, no fears, no difficulties, no issues where you need a refuge, you, you're excused. In fact, I'll just give you a moment. You can go. No takers? Job 5.7 says, Man, human beings are born for trouble as sparks fly upward. Shakespeare says in Macbeth that each new, each new morn, new widows howl, new babes cry, and new sorrows strike heaven on the face. None of us are immune. We all need a refuge. We all need protection. Some of us at different times more than others. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 91, or you can follow on the screen. We'll read this psalm in its entirety, and then walk through it together. I'm going to guess the first two verses will be familiar to most of you. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler, and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your, with our, your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. 
because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my, my refuge, no evil shall befall you, be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. All of us need to learn how to deal with trouble and to learn how to deal with trouble uh, in the one who has ultimately dealt with it. All trouble, all suffering, all sorrow. The psalm teaches us how to do that. The Jewish tradition for this psalm is, this is an anonymous psalm, it's not attributed to any author. Jewish tradition was that if a psalm has no attributed author, you should attribute its authorship to the previous author mentioned. So in this case, that would be Moses. Moses is the author of Psalm 90. Now this, there's no reason to be dogmatic about this, we don't know for certain who wrote this, but I think there's good reason maybe to make that case, and here's why. There are a lot of parallels in Psalm 91 to the story of the Israelites in the wilderness. This is the very psalm that Satan quotes to tempt Jesus. We'll get to that later. The Israelites were in the wilderness for 40, day, 40 years, wandering. Jesus was in the wilderness 40 days. The Israelites failed in that, in their ability to trust in God. Jesus succeeded. Moses is speaking here about the pestilence that stalk comes at night and that it comes at day. Many Old Testament scholars think he's a reference to the Old Testament, the, the plagues his protection of his people when thousands are falling around them. There's no question this psalm contains some remarkable imagery and powerful promises, and I want to just make that obvious statement. The promise is powerful. The whole psalm centers around this idea of that to be close to God is to be protected, that he's our refuge and our shelter, that God is our dwelling place, and the nearer we are to him, the safer we are in this world. God is a place of protection. Let me read verses 1 through 4 again. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, that's feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. I can't read these verses without uh, thinking of Elizabeth Elliot's remarkable memoir or a story of the life of her husband, Jim Elliot, The Shadow of the Almighty. She titled her book, The Shadow of the Almighty, referencing this very psalm. When I was a freshman at Wheaton College, we had dorm rooms named Saint and Elliot. They're still named Saint and Elliot. I just figured those were, I didn't know, what the, just names for the, the dorms. And I remember reading Jim Elliot's journals and The Shadow of the Almighty together for a class I had to take. And discovering for the first time that famous line by Jim Elliot, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And if you don't know the story, maybe you've seen the movie or heard of it, The End of the Spear, where these five men who were missionaries to the Alca people in Ecuador were martyred for their faith. I remember reading his journals and being struck by the, the, the deep confidence they all had in the protection and presence of their God, despite what happened to them. I was then and still today struck by the depth of their faith, the power of their confidence. The imagery in verse 4 is striking. Uh, Elizabeth Elliot writes about this in her book, These Strange Ashes. She says, uh, talks about this idea of God. The, the pronouns used for God in the Old Testament and the New are overwhelmingly masculine. No question about that. He, God is beyond gender, but it's overwhelmingly masculine. However, this image is interesting because it says he will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you under his wings. But the imagery is of a mother bird bringing her chicks under her wings to protect them. I, I'm speculating here, but I think part of the reason God gave us this is because for some people, we grow up with earthly fathers who aren't protective, who are abusive or absent. So we could not make, let's not make the mistake of attributing sinful characteristics of earthly fathers to our heavenly father. Because our heavenly father is also mothering in his love in a way. Covering us. Protecting us. 
sheltering us. As Boaz said to Ruth, may you be richly rewarded by the Lord under whose wings you have come to take refuge. This is a pervasive image in the Psalms themselves. Psalm 36, 7, the children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. Psalm 57, verse 1, in the shadow of your wings I will take refuge. Psalm 61, verse 4, let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. These are just a few examples. Over and over again we see this. In fact, it's the very same image Jesus uses, isn't it? Do you know the story when Jesus coming into the holy city of Jerusalem, nearing the triumphal entry, which we'll celebrate in a few weeks in Holy Week, and he sees the city from the Mount of Olives before he enters in, and he has this emotional moment, this outburst. Matthew 23, verse 37, he cries out, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. You wouldn't have it. Jesus, the Son of God, saying, really reflecting on Psalm 91, saying, I've longed to be that for you, your shelter, your refuge, to have you come to me and to protect you, to gather you, to shield you, but you wouldn't have it. And he knows, of course, where he's going and what the events of the coming week will bring. But you've got to be near him or close to him to experience that. But how are we to understand this promise? I mentioned a moment ago that Joe Scavato's not preaching. He's with his father, who's a faithful, godly man near the end of his life from a terrible disease. Some of you know about the loss of loved ones to disease, to sickness, to pestilence. How are we to apply these, this powerful promise? Because I would suggest the promise is also problematic. I know, there's going to be a lot of alliteration with P's, but I'm a, I'm a preacher, so prepare people. <laughs> well, I, I like to do that when I can. The psalm seems to be saying that if, if you trust God, nothing bad can happen to you. That if you dwell in his presence, if you come under his wings, if you get near to God, if you trust him, if you make him your refuge, then no harm will come to you. Let me read verses 5 through 10 of the psalm again because it's really striking. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. And if we're to read on in verse 12, he says, you won't even strike your foot against the stone. Think about that. The psalm is saying that those who dwell in the shelter of, of God won't be struck by disease, pestilence, won't be harmed by wars or violence, won't be touched by natural disasters, you won't even stub your toe, strike your foot against a stone. Is that how we should understand this? Is that how we're to interpret and apply this? That if you just trust God, nothing bad can happen to you. No. Most of you, most of you don't want to say it because you're not sure you want to be wrong out loud in church, but in your heart you already say, no, it can't, it can't be it. No, that can't be right. Why not? Well, for one thing, let's take the case of Job and his friends. Just in the, in the Old Testament alone, the, this ancient story, which is a case study on suffering, the, the meaning of suffering. Job is a godly man, a man of righteousness and, and faithfulness in God, and he suffers immensely. Loss beyond comprehension. And Job's friends show up, and for a week they get things right because they don't speak. But then they talk, and one by one, they basically say different versions of the same thing. Job you must have unconfessed sin. Job, you must not be trusting God. Job, there's something wrong in your life, in your heart, in your faith. Otherwise, this wouldn't be happening to you. So cough it up, confess it, turn back to God, and all will be well. And then at the end of the story of Job, in the 40th chapter, God shows up in a whirlwind. And he speaks to Job's friends. Do you know what he says? Thank you guys for telling Job the truth. You really got that one right. He says, you have not spoken truth about me. 
He rebukes them and says, you got it wrong. So whatever, however we're supposed to interpret this psalm, it can't be that if we just trust God more, nothing bad will ever happen. And I'll give you another reason. I, I think also, this is, Satan wants you to believe that. Your enemy, and you have one, wants you to interpret it that way. Because then if you do, and your life isn't going well, and you do face hardship and loss and pain and suffering and difficulty, if that comes near you and those you love, you're either going to accuse God for not making good on his promise, or you're going to think something's wrong with me. If that's your interpretation, there's either something wrong with God or there's something wrong with you. Somebody's messed up on their end of the bargain here. If the way we interpret this is, if you trust God, nothing bad can happen to you. In fact, this is precisely, although many, many, many Christians and preachers do try to interpret it this way, this is precisely what Satan does to Jesus in the wilderness when he's being tempted. He comes to him, and among the three temptations, one is he quotes Scripture. Shakespeare says that the devil can quote scripture for his uses, and he's right about that, and he does so. Do you know what he quotes? This psalm. Specifically, the passage about, from verse 11 and 12 about you will not strike your foot against a stone because he'll command his angels concerning you. Satan says to Jesus, look, go up to the top, the top throw yourself down, and nothing will happen to you. Because he quotes this psalm. He will command his angels concerning you so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. They'll save you. The people will then see that, that, that you're the one. This is a total setup. Now this will take some unpacking, so, so stay with me here. Satan does not quote the next verse, verse 13. Verse 13 says, You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. So Psalm 91 says, He, God, will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they'll bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. What, is, what does that mean? Well, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, we get the first hint of the gospel. And that's the, the curse, specifically the curse to the serpent. Adam and Eve have sinned. There are consequences for their sin, and God is going through those consequences to each of them. When he comes to the serpent, the, our enemy, he says, specifically, there will be enmity. There will be tension and, and conflict between your offspring and hers, the woman. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Who's he? The offspring of the woman, ultimately, the one, Jesus. He will crush your head, serpent, and you will strike his heel. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 16, verse 20, says that the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The psalm says that you will tread on the lion. Your enemy prowls around like a roaring lion, Peter tells us. The adder, the serpent, you will trample underfoot. So Satan quotes the first two verses, leaves out the third, the third verse 13. Why? The specific reason is that your protection is in the will of God. Specifically speaking about the Son of God, Jesus, his, God is his refuge, God is his fortress, God is his protector, but in doing what God has called him to do. The psalm can't be applied to go, don't go wherever you want, do whatever you do, and you can just lift this verse out and slap it on your poor decisions and say, God's going to protect me. It doesn't work that way. It's in him that we are protected. The protection of the Almighty comes in staying close to him and doing his will. Because the mission of the Son of God was to crush the head of the serpent at the cross. That's his mission. That's why he came. To defeat evil and suffering and darkness and sin through suffering. So clearly the shallow face value interpretation of Psalm 91 didn't come true for the Son of God. Think about that for just a minute. The most godly, righteous, perfect man who ever lived, this didn't come true for him. He the darkness did come near him. It did touch him. He did fall. He was pierced for our transgressions. 
bruised for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. So I would just put it this way. Protection from does not necessarily mean prevention of. Protection from evil and darkness and suffering and pain doesn't necessarily mean that God prevents it all from ever happening. That's nowhere promised in the Bible. It's nowhere promised in Scripture. It's nowhere seen in our life. We, we quote often Romans 8, 28. Some of you know it. It's often quoted, but I think very rarely understood. And we know that for those love, who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Those who are called according to his purpose. What's his purpose? What was his purpose for the Son of God? That he would suffer at the hands of men and in his suffering bring deliverance, ultimate deliverance from. That was his purpose. Jesus Christ is the only one who ever fulfilled the conditions of Psalm 91. He's the only one who really knows the name of God, who can cry out, my God, my refuge. He did so on the cross. He's the only one who truly knows the Father, who truly took refuge in him, who was truly faithful to him. All the conditions of Psalm 91 can only really, truly be perfectly applied to Jesus. And yet he was not immune to suffering or sorrow or even death. The promise, therefore, is prophetic in keeping with the good P words. It's powerful. It's got some problems to it if, we, if you don't understand how to apply it. And it's prophetic. The devil was right about one thing when he quoted Psalm 91. It does talk about Jesus. Psalm 91 is about Jesus. And in fact, the Bible in general, specifically this psalm, but the Bible in general, is not a mural which we hold up and gaze at. It's a window through which we look to see the person of Jesus Christ. This is how we to read it and understand it. It points us forward to him. Let me read verses 14 through 16, the last three verses of the psalm. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Who's the him and the he in this psalm? Who is that? It's Jesus, but it's also you and me if we are in him. Let me explain this. Just listen to these words that are referenced here. I will deliver, rescue, honor, protect, satisfy, and show him my salvation. There's clearly talking about the man Jesus. All these things become ours when we are under his wings, his protection. But this does not mean you don't suffer. You don't face difficulty in this life. Years ago, I preached uh, on um, the reality of evil and suffering in the world, and I talked about the difference between a line segment and a line ray. Some of you that are in, in physics and geometry will know what I'm talking about. A line segment has a beginning and end, right? Right here, January 6, 1970, Jeff Frazier is born, come into the world, exist, you know. Existed before that in the mind of God, but, you know, come into the world. And then, I don't know when, we'll fix a date, hopefully not tomorrow, but to live as Christ, to die as gain. At some point, there'll come an end to my earthly life. There's, a, there's an end point. If you see your life as a line segment with just beginning and end, then suffering is ultimate because that's it. That's all you get. But what if your life is not a line segment with beginning and end? What if it is a place where it begins, runs through your death, and is a line ray that continues on for all eternity? For all eternity. There's no end. Then the suffering you experience in this little pit, bit of a line segment, which is really pretty small when you think about eternity, isn't ultimate. It doesn't mean it isn't real, it doesn't mean it doesn't hurt, but it, what it means, it puts it in perspective of what God is doing. The good things he's bringing about. Jesus says in Luke 21, in verses 16 through 19, something that's a little confusing, to be honest. 
Let me quote it for you. Luke 21, verse 16. You will be delivered, speaking to his disciples, to us. You will be delivered up even by parents and by brothers and relatives and friends. And some of you they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake. But not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance you will gain your lives. Wait, what? Did you, did you hear it? Doesn't Jesus sound like he just like, like pulled a Joe Biden there? Said something really strange and inconsistent, like it doesn't make any sense? And, and I, maybe I shouldn't have said that, but I did. Sorry. <laughs> I'm not being political. Just like something that doesn't make sense. Like, think about that. Like, some of you will perish. You're going to die. Well, in fairness, President Trump and Bernie Sanders, and they all say ridiculous things. <laughs> they all say things that don't make sense. Anyway. You're, you're going to die, but not a hair of your head will perish. Wait, what? Some of you are going to be delivered and betrayed and die, but nothing, no one will touch a hair of your head. How is that true? It is true. It is true. Let me read to you what Charles Spurgeon says about this. It is impossible that any ill should happen to the man who is beloved of the Lord. The most crushing calamities can only shorten his journey and hasten him toward his reward. To him is not ill, but only good in a mysterious form. Losses enrich him, sickness is his medicine, reproach is his honor, death is his gain. No evil in the strict sense of the word can happen to him, for everything is overruled for good. Happy is he who is in such a case. He is secure where others are in peril. He lives where others die. In other words, if you're in Christ, you, you see the world differently than those who see their life as just beginning and end, and that's it. You see beyond it. And therefore, there's a part of you that's untouchable in that way, that can't be touched, can't be ultimately harmed. This means the promise is personal for us. I want to take you back to this image of the wings, coming under the protection of his wings. This is the image of a mother hen covering her chicks. We talked about that. But you know where else there are wings in the Old Testament and God says that's the place where I'm going to meet with you? Do you know where that is? At the top of the Ark of the Covenant, there are two winged creatures, cherubim, and they're facing each other and their wings are enfolded over their heads toward the center so the wings touch in the middle. And in Exodus 25, God says, I'll meet with you there. There at the place where the wings touch, the mercy seat, it's called, is where I will meet with you to forgive you, to protect you, to bring you under my protection ultimately from judgment, from the results and, and, and rightfully deserved consequences of your own sin. That's where I'm going to cover you. That's where I'm going to bring you in and protect you. This is how we should understand this psalm and apply it. There's a location for these promises, and it's not just in your Bible. I think many of us, many people that I talk to view the Bible this way. Well, the promise is in here, therefore I can apply it to myself. Anybody can buy a Bible off a shelf. Anybody can find a promise in here. Anybody can tweet it out or put it on Facebook or on Instagram and say it applies to me. The question is not, is the promise in your Bible? The question is, is the promise in your Christ? And if it's in your Christ, the question is, are you in him? Because if you're in him, then Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, all God's promises are yes and amen to you in him. But if you're not in him, then they're just words on a page. They don't apply. That's the issue. The issue for us when we read Psalm 91 is not the shallow understanding, I'll never get sick, no one I love will ever die, I'll never have some, any hardship. That is clearly not true, and it's dangerous to interpret it that way. You're either going to end up accusing God or accusing yourself. And some of you have suffered under that false understanding. I want to liberate you from that. God wants to liberate you from that and say, that's not how you apply my word. But if you know my son, he's, he is the location of God's promises. He's the place where God gathers you and protects you and shelters you. He's the one under whose wings nothing, ultimately speaking, can touch you. You might suffer for a little while. Paul says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to what's to come. Yes, yes, there's pain. Yes, there's sorrow. Yes, there's things that are unspeakable in this life. But we know the one who holds eternity in his hands. And if you're in him under his wings, resting in his shadow, that eternity is secure.
Nothing can touch it. It's imperishable, kept in heaven for you, the New Testament tells us. That's how we apply it. The, problem, the question is not, is the promise in your Bible? It's, is it in Jesus? And are you in Jesus? Simple, humble, trusting faith in Christ, John tells us, conquers all things. That's, Psalm 91 is really calling you to place yourself under the shadow of his wings. How do you do that? By placing your, your trust in Jesus Christ. Honestly, at the South Street campus, sometimes I operate under the presumption that all of you already have. But that would be a mistake. It's possible, I've seen it, to be in church all your life, hear all this stuff spoken to you, and never placed your trust in Jesus. Never placed yourself in him. You know about him, you read about him, you sing about him, you talk about him, you even go to groups where he's discussed, but you have never surrendered and placed yourself in him. And know that protection and preservation that and come underneath his wings. Jesus says to Jerusalem, and he says to us, how I long to gather you. How I long for you to come to me. Come under the only truly safe place in all the universe, under my wings, at the foot of my cross. But for many, you won't have it. Will you have it? Will you come to him this morning? I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And for those of you that you have, be reminded of his protection and love for you. Be reminded of what he really promises, what's secure. And if you haven't, pray with me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are a good father. You are our refuge, our shield in times of trouble. And all of us face times of trouble. Forgive us for shallow interpretations of this. Forgive us for thinking that there's some magic formula that if we just say the magic words, nothing bad will happen. That's not true. It's not what you promise. But what you promise God is far, far greater. And so for those that are here this morning who have never placed their faith in you, God, may they right now feel the quickening of their heart by your Holy Spirit. Right now, reach out in faith. Surrender their lives. Confess their need for forgiveness. Receive the forgiveness, grace, freedom, and protection from condemnation that comes from you and you alone, Lord Jesus. And find the security of their life now and for all eternity in you. We thank you, Lord, that all your promises are yes and amen in Jesus. That is how we claim them, and that is how we live them. We thank you in your name. Amen.